I'm Dr. Lynn Winton. I'm from the School of Undergraduate Studies. So I coordinate the quantitative reasoning flag as well as the independent inquiry flag. Uh, I'd like to thank my co-sponsors um, from the Department of Rhetoric and Writing as well as the University Writing Center who's hosting us here in the Learning Commons space. Uh, so I just wanted to say that after the talk there will be some time for questions and answers and there will be food. Um, so I hope you'll stay for the discussion. And just a note that this talk is being recorded. Um, <laughs> and it'll be made available on our website. Okay. So our speaker today is Dr. Joanna Wolf. Joanna received her PhD in rhetoric and composition here at the University of Texas, <laughs> and is currently director of the Global Communication Center and an English faculty member um, at Carnegie Mellon. Her research has been recognized by the Association of Teachers of Technical Writing, the American Society for Engineering Educators, and the Digital Libraries Association. She's author of the popular textbook, Team Writing, A Guide to Working in Groups, and numerous research articles. She's currently working on two book-length projects, Writing About Data, a textbook supporting college-level writing classes, and Engineering Women, Navigating a Male-Dominated Landscape, a research monograph on communication strategies used by successful female engineers. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Wolf. Thank you. So I want to start today by going over a little hi history lesson. So January 28, 1986 was supposed to be a milestone for NASA. This was the day that the Challenger Space Shuttle was to launch, and on board the Space Shuttle was Krista McAuliffe, a social studies teacher from Concord, New Hampshire, who had been chosen out of 11,000 applicants to be the first civilian in space. NASA had wanted to find a gifted teacher who could share her journey with students at a time when public support for NASA was dwindling. And the idea was that McAuliffe would raise some of the public, public support interest in the space program. Now, January 28th, 1986 was a very cold day. It was 18 degrees Fahrenheit in Cape Canaveral, Florida, where the shuttle was to launch. At 11.39 a.m., the shuttle, the shuttle launched, and as is well known, 73 seconds later, it exploded over the Atlantic Ocean, killing all seven crew members aboard instantaneously. And this put NASA into a public relations crisis from which it has probably never fully recovered. Now, Congressional Task Force looked into the cause of the disaster and found that it was due to a faulty O-ring seal on the solid rocket boosters. The engineers responsible for the rocket boosters knew about the problems of the O-ring seal and had warned their managers and had circulated warnings that went to managers at the Marshall Space Center and at NASA. These engineers had estimated a 1 in 100 probability of failure aboard the, aboard the shuttle, and what's worse, they knew that this risk of failure, of catastrophic failure, would increase under cold temperatures. When one of the engineers found out that they were going to launch on such a cold day, he was reported to have said, what business does anybody have even thinking of launching in 18 degrees? We're in no man's land. So why was the, why was the Challenger allowed to launch under these conditions? Congressional Task Force found out that while the engineers on the project were estimating a 1 in 100 probability of risk, the managers responsible were estimating a 1 in 100,000 probability of risk of disaster. These managers had seen some of the documents that pointed to the faulty O-ring seal. But when they were asked about these documents later, they had things like this to say. I don't know if anybody at that time understood the data well, joint well enough to realize that the data was crucial. There were a whole lot of people who weren't smart enough to look behind the veil and say, gee, I wonder what this means. I didn't realize the data's significance. It sounded like old news. Now, these are smart people. These are technologically literate people to become managers at the Marshall Space Center and at NASA. I gave you a copy 
the half sheet of paper that you have is a copy of a memo that the task force spent a lot of time looking at. I'd like you to take a minute to read this and see if you can figure out why did the managers not spot the problems with the O-ring seal? you've probably noticed by now that there's some pretty telling sentences in here. Definitely present in here. Why, why did the managers not recognize the significance of this memo, of this data? Anybody have thoughts? Not really evident. What's that? It's not evident? Mm -hmm. okay. It's kind of buried yeah. in there. Yeah, it only went to 50, at which point they said it's not going to work. So by extrapolation at 18, it wouldn't work either. Uh-huh. All right. Yeah, it's kind of alarming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. If they're trained to read the topic sentences and the first sentences, I'm looking at answer number two there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. All right. The topic sentence is misleading. All right. Even with the first set, the first answer, it reads a little bit maybe more like a textbook than a warning. So it starts off, here's my equation. This is the function. Uh, here's the methods. And the, the background information, the, uh, how, how the, uh, the capacity was calculated and how it was done is given about equal weight or even maybe more weight than the, than the data, than the results here. And it buries it, hides it in here. And these two, the two pieces of information, those two red sentences, are somehow related. And it's not really clear from the memo exactly what that relationship is. They're visually separated. Uh, I believe the relationship is that the primary seal, ha uh, if the primary seal fails uh, during a certain critical time period, then there's a low probability that the secondary seal will hold. And if the temperature is really low, it will not reseal. It will not maintain contact. However, the relationship might be because uh, the secondary seal can't be held in low temperatures. Therefore, there's a low probability. Either one of these uh, is, is a bad message. And the relationship needs to be clarified. It is left implicit. Uh, and this needs to be explained more. Now, my point here is not to critique the challenger memo, but to really point out a common fallacy in our society, which is that many people have the misguided belief that numbers will speak for themselves. The numbers are here in this memo you have before you, but they clearly did not speak. And there were catastrophic consequences as a result. But many people have this faith in numbers as an unvarnished window into the truth. And that is misguided. Now, what's a very interesting paradox in our culture is that while some people have too much faith in numbers, many people have the exact opposite. And the exact opposite belief that can best be summarized in this quote that's often attributed to Benjamin Disraeli, that there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. And this represents a position where numbers are inherently suspect, where numbers can be cooked massaged, manipulated, and that there's something suspicious about the whole enterprise of even looking at the world through numbers. And we tend to 
many people in our culture tend to gravitate towards one or the other of these extremes. And these extremes are reinforced by our culture of schooling, where on one hand we have quantitative difference, disciplines like mathematics that really focuses on getting a right answer, focuses on proofs, focuses on correctness, accuracy. And on the other hand, we have other disciplines, unrelated, that focus on interpretation, that recognize that there can be more than one correct answer, and that we need to persuade people to accept our viewpoint, that there is interpretation. And these two ways of looking at the world are very strictly divided. On one hand, absolute certainty. On the other, things are open to interpretation, and we have to argue for our viewpoints. And this really confuses a lot of students. And we can see this confusion in a recent assignment that I gave to students in my class where I asked them to read a study that looked at the writing habits of six writers, uh, three of which were very strong writers, three were weak writers. And the study concluded that the stronger writers were doing more note-taking and more planning prior to writing than the weaker writers. And I gave this study to my student, partly because I wanted to start a discussion about note-taking and uh, habits, but also because I wanted them to look at research and I wanted them to critique this kind of research and see how it's constructed. And one of the questions I asked my students was, what are the authors, what is her source of evidence and how does she defend that evidence and show that it's credible? And here's what my students had to say. She presents the findings in tables and graphs, so they will hardly be contested. You can kind of hear the tongue-in-cheek, the sarcasm in here. Here's another one, harder to miss the sarcasm. Who's going to argue with information already sorted out into graphs and tables? I mean, come on. It has to be legit, right? Another student. She doesn't seem to think too many people will disagree with her with all the graphs she's giving and all the facts she's giving. It's hard to disagree with a graph. Now, my students are clearly conflicted here because they do recognize that it's a study of six people and that this is a very obvious critique. But they don't know how to go about critiquing it. They are used to a culture, a society, where information in graphs is information that is correct. That is a fact. And what I had hoped that my students would point out in response to my question about how she discusses the credibility of her evidence are the places in the text where she talks about this is a study of six people. There are limitations uh, that uh, I can make from this. Uh, our ability to draw generalizable conclusions is limited. And maybe I'd even hope that some of my strong students would notice some of her hedging language, the ways that she qualified some of her claims. But instead, my students were very distracted by the graphs and their association of graphs with certainty that they couldn't see that she, that she was trying to defend these. And they didn't really have a place for a type of writing where numbers might have to be defended. And so our society really needs a place that lies between these two polar extremes of thinking about numbers. One, that they are true, pure, unvarnished fact. And the other, kind of suspect. We can't really look at the world through numbers when we know that there are multiple different right answers sometimes. And this area in between is argument. And argument is the study of rhetoric, which is an academic discipline. And rhetoric is often defined as trying to find the available means of persuasion. And rhetoric was founded by the ancient Greeks who saw it as central to a democracy because in a democratic society, anybody could be pulled into court and have to defend themselves. And this was particularly so in ancient Greece because there were no lawyers. Uh, but, and any informed citizen had to be able to listen to arguments that were made on the public stage and cast a vote, take an appropriate action. So understanding how to make and how to dissect arguments was seen as central to the functioning of a democratic society. Now, the ancient Greeks 
divided arguments into three types of appeals, or identified three types of appeals, uh, ways that we persuade. And we persuade through the logic of our message, through the content of what we have to say. We persuade through the credibility, the trustworthiness of the speaker. And we persuade through the emotions that we incite in our audience. Now, I probably don't have to persuade you that quantitative arguments involve logic and credibility. But what I want to focus on today is how they involve emotions and how the same number, the same mathematically equivalent way of presenting the same number can have different emotional impact on the audience. Now, I also want to talk about these three different ways to create an argument or three different things that we have to attend to in creating an argument. There's first inventing, finding what you have to say, then arranging and presenting it in a logical order, and then delivering it, presenting it in a way that people are likely to accept. When we develop quantitative arguments, when we display something with a graph, when we show things, we actually are making a series of rhetorical choices, much more so than I think most people believe. Oftentimes, these rhetorical choices rest on definitions of individual words and how things are defined. But we also make many choices about what's important. What do we want to foreground? What is less important? What, do, what should go in the background? And I also want to show you today how, whoops, sorry, uh, how some very small differences in how we arrange, how we order data can have some big impact on the type of argument, the type of story that it presents. So let me first talk about how quantitative, quantitative rhetoric, quantitative argument can involve emotion. And I want to start off with a personal story here uh, that takes place almost exactly 14 years ago when I was pregnant with my daughter. Uh, and I and a friend met for coffee. Uh, she was also expecting at the time. And uh, so we met for decaf coffee. And we uh, talked a lot. And we were talking about these books, what to expect when you're expecting, uh, and about all the sort of scary things that these books brought up. Uh, now, I was lucky. I was 34 at the time. But my friend was not so lucky. She was 35. And anybody who has had children a little bit later in life knows that 35 is the cutoff for advanced maternal age. So my friend was reading a lot of these uh, statistics in these books about all the things that can go wrong. And we were joking that they should be renamed what to worry about when you're expecting. And she talked about one statistic in particular that had really concerned her. Uh, that was that one in 50 women over 35 uh, are likely to experience a certain complication. And this really concerned her enough so that she talked to her doctor about it. And her doctor said, oh, you have nothing to worry about. There's a 97% chance you'll be just fine. Now, OK, all right, some of, you are, some of you are getting it, some of you are not. The problem with this, with this logic, is that a 1 in 50 chance that something is wrong is actually better than a 97% chance that everything will be OK. Let me break this down. All right. <laughs> So 1 in 50 is 2%. So there's a 2% chance of complication. Or a 98% chance that everything will be OK. And 98 is better than 97% chance that everything will be OK. So why? why? Why did my friend find one number really alarming and another number that was actually worse reassuring? <laughs> So we talk about this, and she said, well, I know 50 people. I probably know 50 women over 35 who have had a child. And the idea that one of them could be me is really kind of personal, really uh, takes it, brings it home. Whereas 97%, that's, that's abstract. That's something that has all kinds of scientific certainty or scientific sounding. And 97 is a number also that our culture of schooling has programmed us to say, that's a good job. 
97%, that's an A, maybe even an A plus. You're all right. So these two different numbers have very different emotional appeals. Now we see this. So if someone wants to sell me a raffle ticket, they will tell me, you have a 1 in 20 chance of winning a raffle. Uh, and I think, okay, I've, I've, I've done my share. I've shelled out for more than 20 raffle tickets in the past couple years. Surely this one, uh, my, my number will be up. No one ever says to me, you have a 5% chance of winning the raffle. And they certainly don't say, you have a 95% chance of losing. Get out of here. Okay, because these have different emotional impacts that I'm unlikely to buy uh, uh, on, the, on the last one. So all these statements are mathematically equivalent, but they have very different appeals, different emphasis. So if we're talking about depression, we could say 21.3% of women and 12.7% of men have experienced depression. If I wanna bring it home a little more, make it a little more dramatic, over one in five women and one in eight men have suffered. If I wanna emphasize that gender disparity, I might say women are 68% more likely, or six out of 10 depressed individuals is a woman. That really makes, oh my goodness. Okay. Or conversely, I could flip it. It's not really a problem. Three fourths of women never experience depression. All of these are mathematically equivalent. They're all the same number, but they're expressed in really different ways that have really different emotional impact. Let me show you another example. Uh, so my daughter, the one I was talking about being pregnant with, is now uh, coming up on her 14th birthday, uh, and she's after me to buy a new phone because I am ruining her social life with the cheap phone that she has. And she wants an iPhone which I have no intention of shelling up that money, but just for laughs and because I have this presentation coming up. I'm like, what's the difference between an iPhone and a Galaxy? Uh, and so these are the most recent prices uh, that, I, that were quoted up on, up on Amazon.com. Just to clarify, my daughter is getting neither of these phones. This is a ridiculous amount to pay for a phone. Uh, but let's go ahead and talk about what's the difference between an iPhone and a Galaxy. So let's start off, let's just simplify it. Say one's 600 and one's 900. So one way to represent the difference between these two is $300. But we could also say, if we want to talk about the relative difference, we could say the Galaxy costs 33% less than the iPhone, which I get by taking 300 and dividing it by the price of the iPhone, 33%. Or I could say the iPhone and because I'm anti-iPhone, I will say this costs 50% more than the Galaxy. This is ridiculous, which I get by dividing 300 by 600, the price of the Galaxy. So these are different ways and different choices people have for presenting the same information. But the Galaxy is 50% more likely to have the bad it's, uh, Yes, yes. <laughs> Also to be considered. All right, so let's take a look at another example here. Uh, let's say we have a town and we're looking at crime rates. Let's say in year one, the crime rate is uh, 100 crimes. The next year, it goes up to 125. And the next year, it goes down in year three back to 100. In the year it goes up, crime will have increased by 25%. The next year, it decreases by 20%. So things really do get worse faster than they get better. All right, but so these are choices. This is something that every citizen should be aware of and how we can choose to emphasize one number, to, to make a number more startling by deciding whether, whether we want to talk about the percent increase or the percent decrease. And these are choices, this is rhetorical choice that we have in displaying numbers. So now I've talked about how our choices in numbers involve emotion in many ways. Now I want to talk about how we find arguments about numbers and the different ways that these often revolve around linguistic choices. So let's take an example. Every year airlines use, lose 
thousands of bags. They're required to report the number of bags that they, leave, that they lose. And because it would be unfair to report the number of bags lost by a boutique airline like Iceland Air with a major carrier like Delta or American, they report it in bags lost per passenger. But what's a passenger? So I just traveled from Pittsburgh to Austin. I'm one person. Am I one passenger? Or am I two passengers? Because it's a round trip. Or since I have a layover in Dallas, am I four passengers? And if I miss that flight, that connecting flight, how does the airline count me then? Do I suddenly become five passengers because I was booked on five different flights? I don't know the answer to this, but the airline absolutely wants to count me as many times as possible. So when they lose my bag, they've only lost one in four bags. Whereas from my perspective, if they've lost my bag, that's it. <laughs> I am one person. So how we count things, how we define something as seemingly intuitive sounding as a passenger can have really big impact for what numbers we end up reporting. And we see these kind of arguments about what counts, what do we include in a particular category in all kinds of situations. So what counts as a workplace injury? What's an uninsured person? Do you have to be uninsured for a whole year or just a few months? What counts as a successful Kickstarter project? Or as we recently had a debate in my class, what counts as a video view? Facebook says something counts as a video view if you look at it for three seconds. And since many videos on play Facebook play automatically, this results in a very high count. YouTube, however, has a very complex and uh, secret algorithm, though parts of it are more public, uh, that looks at the length of the video and the proportion that you have actually watched, among other things. And they make sure that they do not count duplicate views. So what counts as a view? Now this has big implications, not only for whose cat video gets the most hits, but of course for advertisers uh, and how, how dollars are apportioned. So many arguments that revolve numbers have this linguistic base at the bottom that could really dramatically inflate or deflate what gets reported, depending on how we define those terms. Now we also, when we have data, we have many choices about what to foreground, what to emphasize, and what to de-emphasize, what to include, what is important, and what is less important. So if we look at raw data, like this. Imagine that these are test scores, and these are test scores for, for schools, and we've reported it by school, gender, race, and the scores. And there are pages upon pages of this, of this data. If I show you this raw data, you probably aren't going to make much sense of it. About the only thing it's good for is looking up an individual's student scores. So I have to make some choices if I want to make sense of this. And those choices are choices about what's important, what's meaningful here. So one choice I might have, I might say, let's look at this data by gender. And if I look at it by gender, I might say, okay, not much going on here, virtually identical. I could look at the data by ethnicity. Now we have a little bit more of a story where we see that Germans and Poles have quite a bit higher test scores than other ethnic groups. So that's a little bit more interesting argument. I can look at it further. I can limit myself to particular subgroups in here and maybe do a more nuanced look at it. So I could look at gender and ethnicity together and maybe also break down by schools. So here now we see that even though males were doing slightly better overall, uh, Polish males are doing well but Slovak males are at the bottom of the heap here. So that the gender patterns go in opposite directions for Poles and Slovaks. Now I can also take these exact same numbers, these exact same data points, and present it differently and have a different argument. So now, what really gets emphasized is that no matter who you are, don't go to school C. 
School C is a problem. But this is the exact same breakdown of the data. So we have these rhetorical choices of what's important that really affects what we foreground, what we report, and the story that gets told. Let me go through and give you another more technical example. So this is data on energy efficient versus traditional classrooms. And it's reported in energy usage per month in three different geographical areas of the country, Detroit, Baltimore, and Austin. Now, if we look at this data, it's small enough. We could probably look at it uh, long enough and make some sense, some sense of it. But it's very difficult. Now, a student, given this data set and asked to, make, to write about it, will probably put it into a graph. And they will probably graph everything, which would look something like this. <laughs> Looking at this, all right, it's, a, it's better. It's better than the uh, raw data here. But what I primarily get from this is that uh, the school buildings use more energy in January than they do in September and May, which I didn't really need a study to tell me about. So we have some choices. What's really important here? Well, we can break it down into traditional and efficient classrooms and look just at those. And this tells us that the efficient classrooms are doing better using less energy. I could simplify this even further if I wanted to get a particular count. And I could just get rid of the month data. And now I can say, all right, the efficient ones are 33%, use 33% less energy than the traditional ones, or 40% more wasteful than the traditional ones, depending on how I want to emphasize that. And I have other choices. So maybe the location is important. So I could also display it like this. And now what it tells me is that these classrooms make a difference in Baltimore and Detroit, but not in Austin. So we have these choices and different ways to present data that really come across with different arguments. And we have to train students to think about these different choices. Let me show you one last example here. I'm going to show you data from the 2008 Summer Olympics and show you how some small choices about what to foreground, what to emphasize, can make a big difference. So here's data from the Olympics sorted alphabetically. Not particularly interesting. Now I'm going to sort it by total medals. And now we see that the US had the most medals. Now I'm going to sort it by gold medals. China has the most gold medals. Now, it probably won't surprise you to learn that the version on the, on the left was run in US media outlets, whereas media outlets in the rest of the world ran the version on the right. <laughs> the only thing that is different is how I sorted it. And I guess I, I emphasize that just so you could see it here. But the main difference is how I sorted it. And by choosing what column to sort on, I am making a different argument about this data. Something as simple as that. So, what are the takeaways here? First, STEM classes really need to help prepare students to see some of these rhetorical choices. That we need to help students see that there's not just one way to, to graph something, that you don't have to graph everything, and that may not be the best choice for telling a story. And that there are multiple ways to interpret the same data. And for quite some time, there's been a writing across the curriculum movement that, and math and science teachers have been encouraged to include more writing in their classes, but are often not sure what to do about that. Sometimes this results in, we'll go write a bi biography on Einstein. Uh, some better variations of that are justify your answer or explain how you got that, uh, or reflect on your own learning in this class. But what I'd like to see is for STEM teachers to take a broader view of what writing is. That writing can be choosing one graph over another. 
choosing different ways to display the data, different ways to talk about it. And this needs to happen much earlier than college. Some researchers have had success doing this with kids as young as kindergarten in collecting their data and making some choices about how to display it, uh, and definitely within elementary schools. So really thinking about different choices, about how to display things, about the different ways that we can represent the same pieces of information, the same quantitative information. Because the choices that we make in deciding what to prioritize in a graph or what column to sort are very similar to the types of choices that writers have to make in essays. Deciding what should be my topic sentence? What should, what, what's important enough to go in the thesis? What is less important? How do I arrange these things? It's the same type of rhetorical, rhetorical thinking. So if we expand what we think of as writing, we will be doing more to prepare students both to reason with numbers and to prepare them for other types of writing. Now, I also think that language arts teachers and writing teachers need to do more to prepare students to work with numbers in civic discussions. That numbers aren't just things that you quote and then run away from to support a point, but you have choices in how to paraphrase it so that you can take something that is reporting a positive result, flip it around and say, eh, it's actually not so good that you have choices that can have different rhetorical impacts on how much people think something is alarming or how much you want to minimize it and reassure people. And we are surrounded in our culture with numbers, and this is only increasing. So you read the newspaper every day. There are studies being reported. Every day there is all kinds of arguments about public policy being made about numbers, data about immigration that we need to be able to take, dissect, think about in different ways, and think about how someone might be exaggerating a claim, and if we just perform a different mathematical operation, that's really not as big a deal as this person is looking at. And everybody will have, at some point in their life, a need to read a medical study to figure out what treatment a loved one should, should have. Or we might need to look at data to decide what school to send our kids to or what phone to buy. So this is very personal. And when we have people in our culture who aren't able to quickly see some of these differences, we have people who are really not literate in our society. And this needs to be the purview both of math and science, but also of language classes. And just as we've had a writing across the curriculum movement, we should also have a quantitative reasoning movement across the curriculum. And we need teacher training that encourages people to think outside the box, to bridge these two, to merge these two, so that we don't have certainty in this class and then interpretation in this class. We need both in all classes, so that students in these mathematical science disciplines see that information is interpreted, that there are different ways to display the same information, different arguments that can be made, and that people in more sub subjective differences, interpretive differences, realize that numbers can offer a unique way of looking at the world and different ways of looking at things. And because someone is looking at data that we normally see as uncertain and contingent, that doesn't mean that that person is absolutely positive about what they're saying or that they're saying that this is the only interpretation or that they don't see any of the flaws of what they have collected, that this can be a valid way of looking at the world. So I'm going to end here just with one last quote from Robert Orwell, who's executive director of the National Council on Education and the Disciplines. In life, numbers are everywhere, and they cannot be segregated into one subject and left out of others, as it often happens when we build our academic cubbyholes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But I don't mm -hmm. what you've done.
one so far doesn't really address the lies, damn lies, and statistic problem. Because the more interpretation you get, the more somebody could say, well, we shouldn't believe any of it. Right. Well, I think that that viewpoint really stems because people do not know, they know numbers can be manipulated, they don't know how. And I think if we teach people how, give them skills and say these are the ways to do it, that they're less likely to, uh, to espouse that point of view. Okay. I had a question, but it ties into that. Sure. Um, I was going to ask what you teach students. Oh. I was going to ask <laughs> what you teach students about uh, various audiences and, and sort of discourse communities, because what I think David is getting at is this idea I, that I think you're pointing to. If you can create the credibility with the audience so that they trust, if you are transparent about the way you're manipulating, manipulating, handling the data, then they're more likely to. Is that would that be fair to? Right, right. Well, absolutely, absolutely. So there's definitely differences in discourse communities. Yeah, you have to hold the mic. <laughs> But also, so we can lie, we can manipulate facts with words. I don't hear anybody saying, let's get rid of words, that that's not a way to represent reality. And I don't think, I think the problem is numbers are really, they're different than words, yes, of course. But in another way, in terms of representing reality, in many ways, they have a lot of equivalency, a lot of similarity. And when we, if we can get people to see that this is another way, an alternative way, of looking at the world. I think, I hope, we can get rid of that mindset, or at least alleviate that mindset, that their numbers are inherently deceitful. And get people to think numbers are no more inherently deceitful than words are inherently deceitful. But also, George, going back to discourse community, absolutely these choices about what to display, uh, what to include, all goes back to what's appropriate for the audience, what's appropriate for the context. How do we summarize for this particular group? How much detail is appropriate to provide? And how much do we need to provide to people about the, the credibility and where things, where things come from? But people also have to be willing to look for it, unlike my students who, even though there was discussion where the author was defending her choices of data. They didn't see it because they're like, she put it in the graph. She must believe everything she says and not see any of the problems with it. Just to follow up again on the lies, damn lies, and statistics thing, I think that what you just said points in another direction, which mm. is that um, there are valid ways to manipulate yes. statistics and in, in invalid ways. Mm -hmm. And so what you can do is sort of, if people understand what the valid ways are, then they can recognize the ones that really that, are lies, like right. claiming that the iPhone costs twice as much as right. The, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so people need more experience, more practice. Yeah, that 50% more is not twice as much, which is a very common one. Uh, uh, so people need absolutely more of that practice and, ways, and more exposure to ways that people can lie with numbers and create, create things, exaggerate small differences, especially in graphs, to visually exaggerate certain types of information. Mm -hmm. Yes? He wants it for the recording. <laughs> Sorry. I think in some ways you, you kind of did concretely address, through example, of what are legitimate and illegitimate ways to use statistics, manipulate statistics. The illegitimate way is the one that blows up the shuttle. Oh, I disagree. When you, when you look at data and you look, you've identified a concrete risk and you ignore or downplay it, uh, you've eliminated the potential, the potential predictive value of those, of those numbers. You are, you, are, you are looking at something that's identified a very real probability mm -hmm. and minimized that danger. So you can say in a lot of ways that responsible and irresponsible use of 
statistics is contingent on their practical value. Okay, so responsible use of statistics is, co is contingent on their practical value. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Not everyone will agree on what the practical value of a statistic is. Uh huh. So I'm not sure I can. I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that just because pra the practical the value practical is going to differ. Value is a front term. It's going to depend on the different audiences and who's, uh, who's listening to them. Yeah. But I think we can agree that someone that stole seven people probably not. It's a bad thing, but, but yeah. could we, <laughs> w would we have agreed that if it hadn't happened? Like there was still a risk, I mean, the, if everything had gone through and the Challenger hadn't crashed, um, and but but all of the rest was true. They still had this problem with the O-rings. It just so happened that it would like would your evaluation of the risk be the same? It's evaluation of the risk would be the same. Well, I mean, there, I, may I, be, there may be two problems here. One is that was the information presented in a way that was deliberately trying to minimize the risk, or was it interpreted in a way that was inappropriate to the level of risk? And it was mainly a miscommunication between, say, engineers and managers that we pointed out. Mm -hmm. and I think level to that, which is in fact that, and maybe this is part of the point here, um, no one actually knows what the right number for that risk is or was. Right. So in, a, in addition to, well, sometimes probabilities can be computed exactly. This is not something, it's not like they had run the Challenger mission thousands of times and we say we know the empirical risk. So I think there's even another layer. There's the imprecision of these estimates. And then that fact that it was sort of buried in, they buried the lead right in your memo that you showed us. Mm -hmm. And then there was another level of interpretation, right? The managers. And you know, we don't know. Were they intentionally? You asked me else why it's a bad statistics regression. Question. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. Were they intentionally yeah. downplaying the risk, or was that a different person's interpretation of the risk? They they actually do know quite a lot because some rhetoricians, a lot of rhetoricians have studied this and you know part of the problem is that a, a shuttle has like tens of thousands of parts and each part has a team of engineers standing behind it saying wait a minute, don't launch, there, this could go wrong and, and so they had had this string of postponements of the launch because all these different things people were saying oh no don't launch, the risk is too high. And so, you know, part of it was that um, it, it, it really wasn't the way the memo was written. It was they, in the meeting, the manager who, who had gotten the memo went in and said, this is absolutely way too dangerous to do it. We, we can't launch under these circumstances. And the higher ups were, Frustrated, and you know there there was this uh, um, PR problem of uh, sort of sort of being accused of uh, paying attention to crying wolf. You know they thought, oh, all of these, you know, can they all really be that serious? And so they they told the guy, the engineer's manager, to take off his engineering hat and put on his manager's hat, and he changed his mind and voted the other way. So mm -hmm. there was a lot going on. Uh, yeah. So it's not just that memo, of course, uh, uh, contributing to uh, to that to that disaster. But that memo did circulate to people who sh should have seen it, but didn't. Even if even if other people weren't verbally warning them uh, in these in these meetings. Yes. Mm -hmm. This reminds me of something I've been thinking about recently, um, which has to do with social media. Um, and if, like me, your social media, like Facebook page or whatever, is pretty much completely dominated by one perspective. Right. Um, you know, I see like lots of memes, lots of memes with numbers, right, showing here's the statistics on this issue, and the prevailing view seems to be that 
either the opposite side of the discussion, whatever it is, must be ignorant, right? right? Must not know the facts and not know the numbers, or evil or stupid, like willfully right. disregarding right. the facts. Uh -huh. So either ignorant um, or deceitful. Right. Um, it seems to not, I don't know if it doesn't cross people's minds or if they have considered this and disregarded it, that the other side of the discussion could be looking at the same facts, the same numbers, and coming to different, a different conclusion. I think that's an excellent point. And I think that uh, I suspect most of the time it doesn't cross people's minds that other people are looking at the same, uh, the same information and coming to different conclusions, presenting it different ways. And that if, that if they presented some of those alarming things some different ways, they wouldn't be so alarming. They wouldn't be alarmed by them. An example comes to mind where um, this was, I, I saw, or my, actually it was my boyfriend, anyway, he saw sort of a thanks Obama meme. <laughs> um, which showed like unemployment rates mm -hmm. at the beginning mm -hmm. of Obama's presidency and then now. Um, and it shows a, a increase right. in unemployment. But so, and he was like, well, this really doesn't seem right to me. And he looks at the graph of the unemployment rate and as Obama comes into office, it's in the middle of this enormous decline, right? Because this is the beginning of the recession and it just plummets right in the, you know, first couple of months of his presidency and has been steadily, oh, sorry, a, a, the opposite of unemployment, that employment rate plummets mm -hmm. and then has been steadily rising since, mm -hmm. but there isn't recovery. So if you look at just, I mean, that's all. <laughs> right, so you can take that and depending on where you cut off your beginning and end point, you have really different stories really that, can be, that can be told, yeah. Uh, and there's uh, lots of those things that get circulated. Uh, Fox, there's a couple from uh, Fox News that get widely circulated. If you look at misleading graphs, those will, those will come up. Though there's plenty of others from other sources, other sources too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I was wondering if there is a um, repository or collection of class activities or exercises that uh, bring home in an emotional and practical way to the students the fact that numbers can be used in different ways for different rhetorical purposes. Basically what you're showing here, but in a worksheet or something like that, <laughs> right? I'm working on one. I'm working on a textbook on Great. this, uh, writing, writing about data. Uh, other than that, I'm, I'm sure there are lots of small exercises, nothing that's really uh, fore foregrounded. When is it coming out? <laughs> it's it's going to be a while. It's still a couple of years, years away. Uh, <laughs> But you know the Edward Tufte books on presentation of quantitative information at least show people some of the things that can go wrong with yeah. interpretation John, of John this. John, John Bean also has a page on, on quantitative writing, and I forget what university it's at, but I can send you the link. Mm -hmm. So as an example, one of the exercises I'll give students is uh, here's, here's the statistic, the statistics on depression, and I'll say write it five different ways and talk about, and talk about which one's more credible than the other. And people need to know like some common ways that statistics that can be factually correct, but not really trustworthy. So for instance, if I talk about something increasing, if I say crime on campus increased by 50%, most people would be alarmed. But if you don't know what the baseline is, you really don't know how much crime increased. So a 50% increase could mean there were 100 crimes and now there's 150, or it could mean there were two crimes and now there's three. And those are very, very different in terms of what's going to motivate and upset people. And that should be something that everybody should ask whenever people are talking about an, uh, a percent increase or percent decrease. What was your baseline? What did it start at? Is that actually something that is worth getting upset about, or is it just one person? 
I think that's something like an interesting component that could be added to when um, STEM classes incorporate things like this, or what are, what are the ethical decisions that are also going into how these data are being presented? Mm -hmm. um, is this an ethical presentation or an unethical presentation? And the very real um, impacts that can have if you're looking at trying to find the best drug for your loved one. Right. Right. Is this an are you is this an ethical representation that's going to lead you to make the right decision for your loved one, or is this a really unethical thing that a drug company is doing? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah. So students need to be taught what is, what are some very common unethical practices, what to look for uh, in, various, in various situations. Yeah. And I do a bunch of exercises where I take some things that are clearly unethical, clearly ethical, and some stuff that's pretty borderline, uh, try to get students to figure it out and see, see where, they, where they fall. Good. Mm -hmm. Thank you.